Okay. So, hello and welcome to Yorkshire Sculpture International's event, Artists, Structures of Support. I'm Megan Goodeve and I'm the Engagement Curator for Yorkshire Sculpture International. Um, Yorkshire Sculpture International is a partnership project between the galleries Henry Moore Institute, Leeds Art Gallery, the Hepworth Wakefield and Yorkshire Sculpture Park. And in summer 2019, we launched our first collaborative festival showing inter 18 international artists across the four galleries and outside in the city centres of Leeds and Wakefield. We also ran an extensive engagement programme reaching over 47,000 participants and importantly for this conversation, investing in artist talent development in Yorkshire. So since January of this year, we've been in a research and development period, reflecting on 2019, doing lots of reading, talking to people, and considering how we build the festival for the future. This talk is part of this process and will feed into key research around um, how we can support artist career development in Yorkshire. And when organising this talk at the end of last year, we didn't know how urgent this topic would be in light of today's global pandemic. So we'll aim to address issues connected to this very human emergency, throwing a light on how we can create positive social action in our locality for both artists and others. Some issues that will be raised in today's talks would have already been present prior to COVID-19, but are now somewhat amplified. Um, we would like to use this discussion as a way to generate ideas on how Yorkshire Sculpture International and its partners can play a role in answering these worries and ensuring the health of our artistic ecology in Yorkshire and of course our wonderful artists. Um, so as ever, thanks to our funders and partners, Arts Council England, Wakefield Council and Leeds 2023 for continued support and enabling this talk to happen today. Um, I now have the pleasure of introducing our speakers and our chair for today's talk. Um, so I'm going to start with Connor. Connor, can you give us a wave? <laughs> Thank you. Um, Connor Shields lives and practices in Leeds and in 2018 was a um, received the Yorkshire Sculpture Park Graduate Award. Through an amalgamation of found and created materials, Connor's work develops as a sculptural response to formations of masculine identity and experiences of growing up in a post-industrial town. His work questions the adopted gender roles that we easily accept and assume, encouraging the viewer to unpick these perceptions. Next up, we have Emmy. Thank you, Emmy. Emmy Ray is an artist based in Leeds and was commissioned as part of Yorkshire Sculpture International 2019 to work collaboratively with a group of English as a second language learners in Wakefield. Emmy's practice is informed by inherited nostalgia, geographical identity and post-colonial museum practices of collecting and displaying objects. She focuses on the ancient mythologies from the Middle East alongside personal oral histories of Iraq, weaving together narratives by forging artifacts and visualising residues of cultural collision. Emmy has just opened a solo exhibition at the Tetley in Leeds in February of this year, um, which is uh, sadly closed, but um, it is a wonderful exhibition. So next up we have uh, Roseanne Robertson. Um, Roseanne Robertson was one of Yorkshire Sculpture International's associate artists in 2019 exhibiting their work Stone Butch within the Hepworth Wakefield's Barbara Hepworth collection display and as part of the associate um, group exhibition Associated Matter at Yorkshire Sculpture Park. Their practice spans sculpture, photography, drawing and performance to explore the boundaries of the human body and its environment. And I'm really pleased to say that following Yorkshire Sculpture International, Roseanne has been commissioned to make a public sculpture by Sunderland Council as a legacy to the 700 women who worked in Sunderland's shipyards. Recently, um, Roseanne has been um, a short let studio holder at Paul Fumia Studios in St. Ives, continuing sculptural works that explore the queer body in the natural landscape. And you can see some of that work behind her now. <laughs> and not quite the beach, which is also lovely. Um, and to chair the conversation, we have Helen Phoebe, there she is, um, who's the head of the curatorial programme at Yorkshire Sculpture Park, 
with a specialism in art beyond the gallery and its central role in society. Helen and her team are invested in supporting artists' careers, most notably through her collaboration with Selfridges to commission early career artists to realise large scale public commissions, as well as creating residency and exhibition opportunities for artists at all stages of their careers at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park and internationally. Um, you may have noticed there are two other people on today's um, call, and that they're my colleagues, um, part of the Yorkshire Sculpture International team. So we have Jane Boyru, there she is, <laughs> um, who's our producer, and Livy Lavarato. Thank you, who's our marketing and programme coordinator. We'll be um, leaving the call shortly um, for the roundtable discussion and then rejoining at the end to ask the audience questions we've collated um, prior to today. So thank you for those that have given us questions. Um, Jane is then going to um, provide a roundup of today's discussion. But before we, st uh, we start, I just want to thank the artists and Helen for agreeing to continue this talk in a new format. Um, it's taken a bit more thought and organisation um, than we originally realised, um, but we all felt it was particularly important for this to go ahead and to have this conversation. So um, please bear with us as we're using new software for the first time and trying this way of working for the first time. Um, we will also be sharing this conversation at a later date as a transcript for those of you who prefer to read it and not watch it. And um, we apologise for not having any um, subtitles on this um, Vimeo, but we hope to get this sorted as quickly as possible. So um, I'm now going to pass over to Helen, who's going to start the conversation with Connor, Emmy and Roseanne. Thanks, Megan. Um, thanks very much for the invitation to be part of this, um, which I think is a really important topic and discussion about how our institutions and publics can really support an artist ecology. And I'm really encouraged that over the last few years, there do seem to be a lot more artists either moving to Yorkshire or staying in Yorkshire if they've studied there, um, rather than kind of the pilgrimage to London. And I think there are a few reasons for that but it's really healthy, I think. And I realise a lot of stuff has changed since we first started talking about the questions today. So we've worked through those to try and make them more relevant to the current situation as it unfolds so quickly, but also the future and what comes out of the other side. Um, and how can we help everyone to be as resilient as possible through that process, really? And Roseanne, I realise you're no longer based in Yorkshire, but the first question is around, um, at some point you have all chosen to be based in Yorkshire and to live and work there. And I wanted to understand what you felt were the advantages and disadvantages of that decision really. Um, Connor, I know that you've moved back to Leeds having been grown up in Middlesbrough and then studying in Leeds and then going back and then coming back to Leeds. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like I said, I studied in Leeds and this is where I started to develop my career and develop my sort of like professional um, studio work. And obviously, since graduating, I won the uh, the Yorkshire Sculpture Park Graduate Award. And um, so I think that was like a great start to sort of to help me in starting my career. Um, and but when I did graduate and I'd done the residency and everything, I did actually move back to Middlesbrough for a year. Um, but I noticed that a lot of the work that I was doing um, was back in Yorkshire. So I was constantly traveling back and forth. Um, so I sort of had some work contracts and I saw them out and I ended up moving back. Um, but I chose to move back because of the sort of connections that I do have here. And um, first of all, like the Sculpture Park and the Sculpture Park have been really great um, to sort of introduce me to other people. And I've sort of, um, yeah, I've started to get a lot of connections around here and I've only been back a few months. So um, just a lot more opportunity for me here. Um, and and do you think there are some disadvantages to being based in Yorkshire as well? Yeah, I do think, like you said, sort of the, the thing about London and everybody seems to gravitate towards London. So there's obviously a lot more funding in London right. um, than other areas. But I think as well, I think things are changing. So I think there is a stigma around you need to be in London to sort of be a, an artist and be practising. Um, but I do, I think that stigma is starting to change and particularly um, Yorkshire right now, people are, people are looking to Yorkshire for sculpture towards the area for that. Um, and that's sure. something like Sculpture International is so useful, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, isn't you've, it? Got, you've got Robot. three major art institutions, you've got the Sculpture Park, you've got the Hepworth and the Henry Moore, all in one area. 
Um, and then Lynx Gallery as well. So all of those venues together working collaboratively. Yes. Um, and how about you, Emmy? You have you always lived in Yorkshire? Have you moved around? Um, so I came to study in Yorkshire in 2011 and okay. I initially came down to study English and sociology and then I dropped out, moved back to Edinburgh where I yeah. pretty much grew up and then went back, I got into the fine art course at the university um, and I just really like lucked out because the course was just really great and really supportive um, and I just found the content of it really interesting. Um, one of the reasons I decided to stay in Leeds, um, or just in Yorkshire generally, I mean, Leeds is where I stay, but um, was in the year above me, there was um, a, a collaborative called Seas Projects that was like made up of different artists um, in the year above. And they'd sort of graduated the year before us and had kind of got in, involved in like the local like artist led scene and had, I guess like, we're all working different jobs and also kind of trying to support like a practice and like having studios and I feel for the first time like it seemed to be something that was sustainable and like that was like a career option or like something that you could do rather than like I think when I kind of was coming up to graduating had I not had that I was a bit like oh, I don't really know what I'm going to do with an art degree like I didn't really think that like being an artist would be at all like a, a route that you could go down like I thought it would be you could adapt it and I mean, you can like but I was like oh I'll do something that isn't being an artist but having had people who were like engaging with what was going on in the city um and like using spaces like at the time it was much easier I think to get um like short let space spaces or like set up studios um and yeah I think that was just really like inspiring just to be like oh like I could probably get a job and like well I needed to get a job but I was like I could get a job and like get a studio and like kind of ba balance the two and kind of like live and I just yeah I guess stayed in Yorkshire because all my friends were doing the same thing. And do you and think there's an advantage in the fact that Leeds is smaller than London that there is a tighter network perhaps? Yeah I think so I do think I, I do think that I don't know I feel like I, my experiences of London are so little like I've yeah. never really spent very much time there I don't really know how their ecologies of like artists yeah. networks work but it does seem like obviously there's a lot going on in London and there's a lot of different kinds of spaces that kind of interconnect. I don't know whether Leeds has that as much, um, but I do think that it's something that is growing. And I think that like there's different avenues that are like different cultural centers that are popping up in Leeds that I think are bringing people together in a way that maybe is kind of echoing London or what I presume to be London, but I don't know. I do think Leeds is a really like good place. And I think a place that's constantly evolving um, like it's not had like something written for it like in some ways I feel London has. Do you think there's a scope then for um, institutions to have more connection with artist-led spaces and with universities and to try and kind of join those relationships up a bit? Yeah definitely I do think that um, there could be like definite I don't know more opportunities for like artist led spaces or artists who graduate and like having a kind of platform between like the jump from you know having studied uh, in Leeds and, and working and whatever to then like suddenly being outside yeah. of the education system and kind of feeling a little bit like oh I don't know what to do I don't know how I'm going to get a show if that's what you kind of want to yeah. go into or like I don't know it'd be quite, quite interesting to see like how institutions and universities can offer like pathways for like students to kind of return and I don't know, develop their practice. Actually, it's really useful to think about that because we do have the Graduate Award, but that tends to be only one a year, but there could be a right. way that maybe more people can use that as a pathway because we definitely see that as a transition that mm -hmm. when you leave university and you don't have a studio or peer support or, you know, suddenly you're kind of out there, whereas we can just help yeah. start that journey a little bit. Definitely. And how about you, Roseanne? Uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, well, I moved to Yorkshire from Manchester, so I've uh, studied in Manchester and I lived there post-graduation, so my first studio was in Manchester and all the sort of ways I developed post-education was all in Manchester, all the DIY sort of stuff that I did was over there, yeah. but then I moved to Calderdale, and so I lived in Tonbedon uh, and uh, Hebden Bridge. And I've got to admit that I actually continued to say that I was a Manchester based artist whilst living in West Yorkshire for like quite a while. And I found it difficult to, um, my identity as an artist, I felt like it was really linked with a bigger city and with Manchester as a queer artist. I felt like 
that was still like really a big part of my identity and I was quite hesitant um, um, about saying that I was a Yorkshire based artist and that feels a bit strange now because now that I've been so connected with the place um, via the different galleries and via YSI it definitely feels part of my identity as an artist but I think it was a difficult move um, at the time. Um, I think that's partly other people's perception of Manchester versus Yorkshire as cultural centres or is it more bound up with where you grew up? And I think so I think I just had um, I think it is an outside perception and that I think my anxiety at the time was that it's better to be connected with a bigger city so yeah. it's this thing of like London or Manchester and I think also just because because I'd developed a lot in that city I just felt like quite a strong connection to it but it's that's why things like um, YSI are really important because it really you know we've all got our connections with the place that we live and work but it really joined me up to the conversation a lot more so even you know the history of sculpture in Yorkshire I felt so much more connected to that and that is now a big part of my practice so even though I did move off quite quickly after the end of YSI I didn't do that because Yorkshire wasn't a great place to be based as an artist I did it because I felt like my practice was really developing and could keep developing um, on from that. So yeah. moving down here is just a part of my development that it might not have even happened if I hadn't yeah. been on my SI or been in Yorkshire. All part of the journey. Yeah. And I think, like Connor said, I do think there is a shifting. I, I feel that as somebody who grew up in Wakefield and was told growing up in Wakefield to lower my career expectations and also not to apply to Central St Martins because I wouldn't get in because I was from Wakefield. So I feel throughout my career things have changed I mean it was a long time ago to be fair um, but also I think the current situation that we're that we're constantly minute by minute seeming to be trying to make sense of and adjusting to and we've got this kind of unsurety about what's happening next what's around the corner and just taking it a day at a time but, but I'm already noticing that there seems to be a leveling up in just in this immediate situation everybody is in the same situation everybody's got access to the same content all the museums and galleries are closed pretty much around the world so suddenly there is this i don't know just in this moment there does seem to be a slightly different doesn't really matter where you are i don't know if you felt that at all or noticed that i mean have you kind of thought through that with your networks have you felt that suddenly in some ways you're more connected digitally because everyone's online suddenly yeah i think so i think that like the it's kind of opened up a lot of different avenues of how people are sharing work and like how people are kind of being a lot more forward in some senses like I feel like I'm not like amazingly like in tune with like you know Instagram and stuff like that like I do use it but I don't to try not to spend loads of time on it but I think at the minute like um it's it's just really like nice how people are taking different kind of challenges or different kind of um like most of posting work and like making their work accessible so I think like I saw uh, Bass and Magdade like put his entire um, videography like well I think it's always been online but I hadn't I wasn't aware of that but I think kind of making a thing and being like oh it's like open and like Lawrence Albert hands in as well like I, I thought that was just really nice because it's like oh like these are works I normally would never have watched maybe but now I feel like I've got the access to them and it's great to be able to kind of see that so I'm, I don't know I think it's quite interesting in a way but also yeah I don't, I don't, I don't really I, I do think people are kind of stepping up and like like sharing a lot of things I think there's also been artists who have always like done that as well and I think now that everybody is like in a situation where you know all the museums and galleries are closed and you know we don't really know what's going on like it's interesting how everybody is kind of just being a lot more open with digital sharing and have you noticed a difference Rezan? I mean I suppose it's like different for you because you're in Cornwall so you were in a different context anyway in the new studio. Yeah I mean I think it does still matter where we are all based on where we choose to be connected with so the places like I think my whole project was about connection to place and it was really very much about like the landscape and physicality and um, it's made me think a lot more about well, it completely changes our we, our access um, to physical space and connection and contact has completely changed very, very quickly. And it overnight made me think about opening up my practice in new ways. Like I think little parts of my practice that were um, 
but already open to me in my, in my studio really I'm thinking about more ways of opening that up to people in a much more accessible way so I just started filming myself um, doing my drawings which I don't really usually share with anybody and I thought this would this might be something that people want to see or this might be a way of open because my plan was to have an open studio at the end of my time right. here how can I have a, how can I have an open studio how can I bring the studio to people digitally in a more like in a tangible way and um, so I started filming myself in a, in a way that I've never done before um, but I've got to say like I think I think it is sort of it's a sort of leveller and it is sort of putting everybody's in the same position but what I've what I would like to say is that I think there's there's artists that have been working in this way for a very long time disabled mm. artists and artists with chronic illnesses who the internet has been the place that they share their work and where they operate and I would like I think disabled artists actually really lead in this field so when I am looking through my Instagram and there's artists who are saying hi you know we've been here forever and now everybody's looking at these platforms. Well, let's do let's do everything in this new way. Mm. It's not it's not new. Yeah, people have been doing this for a long time. People have had, um, you know, the challenges the challenges that everybody's facing now. A lot of people have been going through for a long time. All the anxieties that a lot of people are facing now. Um, disabled artists have had um, always, and I think we've got to look at disabled artists and how they're using online platforms in a really creative way and how they're leading in access. Um, so I think this could be a really good opportunity actually to, I think, realise how programming could completely change yeah. digitally and with um, disability arts like leading on that because I think they have been for a long time. So there's like accounts that I'm looking at that are just so useful and yeah, I just wanted to mention a few like Instagram yeah. accounts actually. So it's, it's, it's invalid art or invalid art. Um, so it's I N V A L I D underscore art. And then there's hot crip, hot dot crip. Uh, artists like Bella Milroy and uh, Romilly Alice Walden and zines like Abel Zine. So I think like, yeah, it's a good time not to think, I don't know, reinvent the wheel sort of thing and, and look at what these artists and organizations have already been doing i think that's a really good point and it's it has kind of shone a light on a different area of practice that might not have had as much attention as it should have done and i think it also gives institutions so it's made me had a moment of pause about well do we carry on doing everything the same way after use this space which is always you know as we've grown up with access to the internet it's suddenly taken a much um it's suddenly become such a, a vital resource in our lives right now hasn't it and i think it's going to shift the way that people don't just take the internet for granted but actually i, I can see after this happens people traveling a lot less either because they're out in the airlines but also because they don't need to you don't actually need to go to do a talk overseas you can do it like this um, and how about you, Connor? Do you, how are you finding things changing during yeah. this situation? Um, like you said earlier, I think we're all sort of in the same boat right now with everything closing down and everything just being on a complete lockdown, um, yeah. near enough. But yeah, I think the way that it's been reformatted, like that they chose to actually do this differently and for it to still go ahead, um, I think is sort of like a learning experience and um, looking at new ways of, of sort of how can we bring this conversation forward and how can we keep it going um, without it being sort of like a face-to-face -face discussion um, and then it sort of does open the question is it a lot more accessible now like you're saying Roseanne um, do people can more people have access to it um, than they would have like not everybody can get to Wakefield um, essentially anybody can come and see this from where all over the world wherever they want to if they want to tune in and see it or read it online so um, does it open it up to more people and I, I think that it does um, and I think it's actually a really good way of doing it and I think we'll learn to we'll all learn a new way of working after this and um, I think there's a lot more a lot more aware of how we can actually do things differently. What do you think the positives might be what do you think I mean Already the environment seems to be benefiting, but whether that's just a short term thing and then as soon as we get through this 
suddenly it's all going to be full systems go again and you know we're not going to learn anything from it but what you know as from an optimistic point of view what do you think some good uh, things might come out i think that like the one thing that i think i'm like i think would be really good is that like to, to kind of know what what is really important in terms of like trying to upkeep a practice and also like trying to upkeep employment and all that because i feel like it's so easy for artists i think to burn themselves out when they're balancing so many different uh, opportunities or like trying to get the next opportunity or i don't i don't know and then also like balancing that with work and then actually just not looking after yourself very well and i think taking the time to actually you know now that that you know i think there is a lot more time um for us to kind of i i, I don't really know like we, you know we, we can't leave our homes um to just kind of think about what it is important to us and like trying to find time to do that and like hopefully that I hope that stuff like that like maybe reading or like researching or I don't know what it is like that it kind of is maybe the more holistic side of stuff which I think sometimes gets pushed aside because it's always about like oh I need to reply to this email I need to do this I need to do this I think that kind of frenetic way of living and that pressure that I think a lot of young artists put on themselves and not just young artists just artists all over I do think that there is this pressure to like keep going get next thing like smash it out smash it out smash it out and I just do think that I hope that this period will kind of just you know let us be like all right do you know what it's fine we can just take it slower and that's not a bad thing at all and I think yeah that's something that I definitely feel I hope will kind of be a lasting legacy of this as being like it's fine it's, it's almost <laughs> questioning the kind of whole idea of progress isn't it that we have been lulled into this sense of believing that we are progressing and we're getting better as a as a species and actually you know we never thought we'd be vulnerable to something like this this is something that happened to people before us or in another place and suddenly it's kind of exposed what a construct that was really and all the things that we thought were important actually a lot of those were not that important um which is it yeah it's a it's a really interesting moment to pause and recalibrate what do you think Roseanne? Yeah I think and uh, what you're talking about is that it can really make us consider ableism and and how we operate how ways that we have been operating are ableist in that sense because um, there's a lot of things that people are now considering in terms of health and um, well-being and, and a lot of conversations that people haven't that weren't really having before now on a, on a met on a mass sort of scale so i think that could be really useful going forward that people continue to have conversations um about care um i think it can also highlight something about the precarious nature of um how a lot of artists and freelancers and self-employed people are operating so i think it can highlight conversations around poverty and low income and i think yeah. something like this just shows how little of a safety net there is for artists and self-employed people and freelancers um all dependent on this sort of like gig culture or zero hours contracts or part-time low income uh, part-time employment and how you know when i when this sort of the news of that this virus came out i was at, um i was at the hepworth wakefield at the, the research at the hepworth research network and I was kind of in this bubble of not really understanding the extent of what was going on, I think. And then when I came out, I'd had so many emails about things being cancelled and it just dawned on me. OK, so all of the avenues, for my income for the next month, two months are kind of shutting down. And then the panic sort of seeps in. of How am I going to make any money? And I think a lot of support's come out since. But in that moment, in the short term, you realise that you've got no support, you've got no sick pay, you've got no cover for stuff like this and I mean one of the frustrating things that I find about the art world is the inability to talk about money and uh, we have to because artists are in really um, precarious situations where you know if something like this happens even if something like this doesn't happen a lot of artists are in, in, in poverty anyway and don't have access to you know even food gas and electricity and proper housing and stuff like that so I think I would like to see us not go back from being able to have conversations around things like this and I mean what would be amazing is if we could actually put some actual structures of support in place that there was a safety net for artists I think 
like the Arts Council coming forward and doing like emergency, uh, an emergency fund and small grants and stuff like that's coming through. But I think if a lot of artists, artists were actually honest about what it is, what it can be like if you're from a poor or working class background, or even if you're not, um, yeah. when pay, when there isn't enough pay to go around, really, um, I think that this could be an opportunity to have conversations. It can highlight that, like those conversations that we could have been having. It is definitely highlighting that, and it's highlighting it um, across a societal level, isn't it, as well, about um, those at the lower end of the economy financially um, are the most exposed to something like this. But because it's such a mass problem now, it is getting a lot of attention, it's getting a lot of focus. Um, what do you think, I mean, in an ideal world, what do you think the solution to that is almost like um, a universal salary or is there, I mean, I'm not saying that any of these necessarily could be practically employed, but what, what would the solution to that be, do you think? I think some sort of formal support, because I think what people realise is, I don't know, the Arts Council sort of coming forward with support or organisations that you work with regularly coming forward with support. It's all, it's dependent on whether, you know, the Arts Council, I think, gave instructions to try and support, support where you can and try and, you know, there's, there's talk of redirecting funds that might not be used to support artists and stuff like that, but it's, it's always dependent on each organisation making that decision or within their capabilities. So something more structured um, that had a, a basic safety net thing. Is that because there's no continuous income, basically, unless you have a job outside of your practice? You're reliant on project to project, gig to gig? Yeah, like gig to gig. And I think it's, it's I think organisations can fall into the habit of treating artists as if they're working for an organisation in the same way as they are. Like you get asked to do quite a lot of stuff that people who work in the arts, um, you know, they've got a wage coming in. So but artists get asked to do quite a lot of the same sorts of things, but we don't have the backup. We don't have any of the support that would come from working for a large organisation. We don't have holidays, we don't have sick pay, we don't have any of these securities. Um, and I think some of the little things that might seem little to some people when you're asked to do the admin sort of unpaid admin and all of all of that unpaid work that comes with it can build up quite a lot. So, so on a very kind of practical level, I mean, what do you think institutions can do to help soften that economic strife? really, I suppose, to not have such high expectations of what an artist is able to do for a fixed amount of money, perhaps, for one thing. Yeah, I think really just to consider what they're asking artists to do and, and just to understand that, just to understand that situation that we're, that we're in, that we don't have, we don't have that support around us. Our support comes from, you know, working from project to project, working with an organisation. It doesn't come from anything sort of fixed. Um, I just think it's useful just to not yeah. assume that artists have kind of got any financial security, like just understand how precarious the situation is. Um, I, yeah, I feel like my experience from this is like, because I work four days a week um, and I, I balance like, the one day that I don't work and then my weekends are my studio time and alongside that and I think it's that it's also like in this situation like I found myself in a very lucky situation because I do have a job and I do have like a salary coming in um but it's it's when when you know before the lockdown and stuff it's like it, it becomes so unmanageable to actually take on projects and to kind of build on the projects you're getting because the financial money that is coming into them is very little and actually doesn't give you any stability and I think when you have commitments like care or if you're paying your rent or whatever like sometimes the option to not have a job is really difficult like I feel like in my situation like to have like a stable job is something if it doesn't work out like like I have a brother with autism and it's like right if that doesn't work out if the art stuff doesn't work out like at one point that's going he's going to be my responsibility so I also need to have that kind of stability and to be able to be like right okay like I can provide or I can you know like having this thing so 
I don't know like maybe it's that it's like the what you are asking artists to do alongside like the other commitments that they are kind of juggling and like to give stability because I do think that that's something that we also do want like is to to you know be able to plan things for the future like I'm sure there's so many people at the minute are in situations where you know their funding has been cut or their projects have been cut and it's like they just don't have that and it's really uncertain and I really yeah I just it's it's really shit do you think Sorry. there's any scope, do you think there's any scope for building um a culture of collecting art of buying art in Yorkshire I mean it seems to me that there's potentially so much money in the commercial sector that that is a very elitist and removed aspect of the art world Whereas, you know, trying to be able to facilitate artists to be able to sell their work, because I don't think um, a lot of people, it even crosses their mind that they can. They may go to a shop up the road and buy something that's mass produced and have it as something in their house that they enjoy. But I don't think it's even part of their mindset for a lot of people that, oh, I could actually, for the same amount of money, I could buy an original artwork. Or do you think that is something that institutions could help to try and create channels for yeah certainly yeah Definitely. i think i think a lot of artists in yorkshire maybe, maybe it's just the north in general and work with publicly funded galleries the conversation around selling work uh, i just maybe it's, it's um, the galleries that i've worked with are not commercial galleries and they don't yeah. see it as their position to sell work which is fair enough but it would be really useful if I could sell some work uh, and, and to have the platforms to be able to do that. I think when you talk about the disadvantages of um, being Yorkshire based or I think it can extend to the north of England, um, it is the lack of opportunities for representation and galleries and commercial opportunities. And I don't think it's just like an elitist um, thing to sell work. It can be like, it's, um, it can be a really, basic it can it can be such a useful sort of transaction it could be something that to, to sell my work could mean that i could afford to live for another six months and eat it could be also quite a, give people the opportunity to have something in their homes that they really treasure you know that isn't just the same thing that possibly everybody else can access but that is very special to them because that is something that i'm really interested in trying to develop more at the sculpture park is giving that platform because we have selling exhibitions anyway we have mm. Um, through um, our craft and retail arm and it just seems a bit of a no-brainer that we could be doing that for for you know everybody. I and think that's why a lot of people don't go into the arts and sort of like look at it as not a real career because a lot of people think that you can't make money out of it and it is hard obviously to make money out of it because um, like, like everyone's been saying about like selling your work and how it's perceived and people don't think about buying it but I think if that's something that is encouraged and and sort of I don't know whether it be with the institutions to sort of encourage people to actually invest in art and invest in artists and then maybe then the arts would be seen as like a career that is like like a viable career that people can go into and make a living off and I think the three of us are privileged to be able to actually practice as artists and you know make somewhat make some money off it um but then again, some people like I have separate jobs to it, and so does so does Emmy. Um, so I think, yeah, I think it's it'd be good for institutions to find some way to actually encourage people to invest in artists, because then I think then more people would actually um, want to go into the arts, and it would become more of like a more of a career path. Whereas like alternatively, it's being cut. The funding is being cut in schools because it's seen as not like a necessity or something that's not going to bring the money in. But creative industries bring so much money into the country yeah. and that's sort of overlooked particularly in education i think you're absolutely right and i think something that has come out of this moment that we're witnessing all around the world is how much people do value culture um you know when they haven't got anything else they've still got music and singing and dancing and art and creativity and i really hope that that is something that people remember that it's not like Maslow's hierarchy of needs where it's the, it's the icing on the cake when everything else is sorted out. It's actually something really fundamentally about who we are as, as people. Um, what do you, um, how do you think the creative community is going to get through this? I mean, I know you can't predict the future, but do you feel 
what are the immediate concerns and what do you think the opportunities might be connor um i think creative people always find different ways to actually approach things and how to how to get things done differently so i think they will always find a way um mm -hmm. like we've sort of found this way to do it digitally yeah. um what was the second part of the question sorry um just it's kind of like the immediate and then the longer term um challenges and opportunities i suppose and how it does seem like this is bringing people together not physically obviously but um mentally and psychologically and hopefully i suppose that can be built on once we get through this and that things don't just go back to how they were yeah maybe keeping sort of like a mindfulness of of what has happened and like what could have went wrong sort of being aware of um how things could be differently going forward can what what support structures can you bring in which weren't there before for if you know god forbid anything on this scale happened again what could be put forward as a because i'm sure the, the country and the government are going to be putting things into um play after this thinking what are we going to do to support people if this happens what can people do what can artists do what can institutions do to um put in put a sort of a safety net in in place so that um you know if it comes down to it like what i'm saying um whereas like this is with a lot of freelance people you your business is gone what can we put in place to actually ensure that and i'm not too sure what that is but that's something obviously to be to be worked on how about you emmy i guess like similarly feeling you know that way just i guess the other thing is like one of the the, I guess like yeah the positives of it is like finding different ways of working and different ways of interconnecting like I don't know I feel like a week ago I would have never thought of like having a video call like this like ever with like any other peers or any other artists from like around the world or like wherever like it just I never would have thought like this is a way of like actually getting to talk to people and to talk about this and it's like could that be a way of going forward is this like a way that you can do residencies that will become way more accessible for loads of different people especially artists with disabilities people with access problems like not problems not the word I was looking for but yeah like access um yeah, like, I don't know, like, I think things like this is really good. And I think that like the community is like kind of shown that it's very willing, like from the very little that I've seen, like on like online and stuff. Um, yeah, I guess like the concerns is just like, how does this, how, how would artists be able to support themselves through this? Like how would funding streams go in? Like, would there be um, commissions or like, would there be something that would take place like, on this kind of virtual way um, what happens if people have kind of sculptural practices like will that kind of how, how does that translate and I think that's something that everybody like or people I don't know like something that I'm kind of questioning at the minute is like oh how do I like think about things in a different way I don't really know I mean it's it's still very new and very weird and, and hard to predict but I do think that there will be like a lot of positives to take away from it um, it is it's pretty terrifying in the way yeah. that it has thrown everything everything that we knew has been turned upside down but then slowly it, think, it feels like certain sureties are, are starting to i don't know it's amazing how people quickly adapt isn't it and how oh. resilient people are what do you think roseanne yeah i think just going back to what i was saying about um disability arts and artists with disabilities and, and chronic illnesses like leading in this realm i think it could be really exciting to see um i think maybe it's even more digital programs but led by disabled artists and artists who've already been using this in a really exciting way i think there could be some really exciting collaborations and and i just think programming wise there's going to be there's going to be completely new ways of working like i hadn't used i hadn't used zoom before um i hadn't I hadn't thought about connecting in this way and even though it's not something that I would naturally think of doing I'm now thinking about more of what I sort of more of what I, I need and more about who could access my work because yeah the way that I can share my work more digitally can access more people the way that I'm doing my open studio here now rather than being for a few people who can get to this location are going to be for a much wider audience and I think I think 
yeah, I think it can change programming completely. And I, what I would love to see happen from it is the artists who have not been able to physically access our galleries and museums and opportunities, but who are, who, like I say, are doing really exciting creative things online already, um, will be part of programmes going forward. I think it could, it could be a great opportunity to access. Yeah. Just quickly adding on to the end of that, um, sometimes spaces and um, gallery spaces and maybe like studio spaces to somebody who doesn't have um, sort of an arts background might find them quite intimidating. So maybe the maybe having something like where they can watch from online from a, like a safe distance um, if they're sort of quite wary could um, engage with people who maybe do not have that background and who wouldn't usually go to them spaces. So again, thinking about opening up audiences and who can actually um, participate and get involved. I think that would be good for a good way for that. So I run, although we've been kept apart, there's scope to break down barriers that are already being broken down kind of inadvertently, which is, is really positive. Um, I'm going to bring Megan back in now to, um, I know we've got a number of audience questions that have pre, been pre-sent. So I think if Megan has those. Thanks everyone, that was really, really interesting. Thank you. Hi guys. Hi. Thanks. Hi again. Hi. Jane, are you going to join us as well? Is Jane coming? Yay. <laughs> um, thanks so much. Um, so yeah, um, we've, we've collected some um, audience questions in advance and um, thank you again for those who have sent them in. Um, Lily and myself are going to read them out um, well, we're not going to read them out. We're going to ask them in our own words. Um, and Lily's going to start, so I'll hand over. Yeah, cool. Um, thanks, everyone. That was really interesting. Um, so this first question, I think, um, is kind of asking about how you approach self-care in your practice normally, and then also kind of thinking about how you might approach self-practice, I mean, self-care in um, your practice now with the situation that we're in. Um, so yeah, any thoughts, kind of more specific ways that you might do that? I think that I am, um, I don't give myself enough time off usually. And I think we've touched on this like a few, few points um, earlier. Um, particularly what Emmy said about being a young artist and sort of being early in your career. I feel like there's a pressure to always be on it and always like on to the next thing, on to the next thing. And whenever I do give myself time off, I, um, I, I, my mind's always working so I'm, like, I'm always thinking of like what is the next thing coming up so I never sort of give myself a mental break and this is actually being like quite quite a refreshing experience because with everything in the foreseeable future actually cancelled I've got nothing for my brain to focus on next so I've been sort of forced into giving myself a real break mm -hmm. um, and it's been nice to sort of have that mind space and sort of decom like decompress um, so I think going forward, something that I will be doing is actually making sure that I do have this time to take for myself and to actually take time off because, you know, it's, it's sort of, it is your work. It's like you are passionate about it, but it's, it's your job at the end of the day. And if you, you need to give yourself time off. So I think moving forward, something I will be doing is making sure that I have breaks where I let myself completely switch off. Yeah, I think, yeah, we do work in a really competitive field where the culture is to just keep going and like I think it's often just driven on sheer determination by by people and and the, the culture of just having to say feeling like you have to say yes to like whatever comes up you don't know you know it's just that precarious nature of not knowing what opportunities will be available and there's only a certain amount of opportunities available anyway um so I mean my best I feel like my best work always comes from when I just stop working and just try and I mean that's what I did last year just give myself the time to just experiment and be open to new ways of working so um, I think as far as possible I mean this is a really anxiety inducing situation and a lot of people's mental health is going to be affected by it but if it's possible to just I think go with the flow of the situation and kind of yeah regroup and take time if it's possible like I was just talking to um, Emily Speed earlier on on Instagram. That this, um, when you're in this situation of you just powering away, powering away, at, um, 
your work and sort of opportunities that come up, it's quite difficult to feel like you've got to let go of that a bit. So I'm just in the process of trying to let go a little bit at the minute and yeah, taking it easy. Um, Self-care wise, I've got three cats and I just try and take time to cook and really realizing like how wasteful we we can be, how wasteful I've been and thinking about food and obviously all the panic buying and stuff that's going on, like using every little bit of resource and food and being more thoughtful. Um, so yeah, it's really changing sort of where I'm at and how I'm thinking at the minute. I, I feel like um, similarly to to uh, to what you've you've just both said, like taking the time now to to just take a bit of a breather and allow ourselves to actually have the space to think about like work in a different way or to like read the books that have been collecting dust on our bookshelves because we're just too busy to do out or like I don't know. Um, yeah, I feel like I had a really bad week last week trying to get to terms with everything that's going on and like taking some time away from like my phone or like the news and just to kind of like get myself on track and again like, like panic wasn't there it was like an escalating panic and lack of control and just yeah, like everybody sure. well, pretty much everybody going how is my job what is the future what is my hat you know my house everything it's just like yeah. But I felt there was also kind of almost still a pressure to keep like going through with it and being like, oh no, like it's fine. Like yeah. we're just going to quickly do this transition into like doing things online or like doing things. Whereas I feel like, like I found that very overwhelming. So I feel like I've taken a bit of time away and now I'm kind of like in the process of accepting and like just being like, this is the situation that it is. And, you know, like, alhamdulillah, like, like everything's fine. Like in, in terms of like, yeah. I don't know, like I, I, hopefully my family are all right and stuff and like there are more important things and I just hope everyone else is okay too and the situation gets better but um I mean like for me like like before this I think my only like solace of like self-care is literally doing a skincare routine like every morning and like in the evening like literally skincare is like my time to just be like right okay <laughs> gonna like moisturize very heavily <laughs> Um, yeah it's good to have a routine though yeah, yeah definitely I feel like it, it really keeps me in check <laughs> yeah those are great I think I think kind of thinking about how you how much you're expected to do as an artist and like kind of when the situation wasn't like this so you kind of stop and you're like wow you know kind of balancing spending that time to make your work which you know you kind of want quite a lot of peace and quiet and a clear mind but then also kind of balancing that with like applying for opportunities and having loads of things in your calendar, like it can be really difficult. So it's interesting to hear your take on that. Thanks. Um, so I, I've got a question here, um, which is around kind of alternative and non-formal structures for arts education. And I think, um, Emmy, you touched upon it right at the beginning when you were talking about people in the older year group having a kind of artist-led network. Um, so this person would like to know about what non-formal networks are you part of that helps you develop as an artist? And, um, or if you're not part of them, what structures or networks would you like to see? Um, I feel like over the past, since, well, since Yorkshire Sculpture International, like I was lucky enough to get one of the, uh, engage, to be one of the engagement artists. And I think that's been a really nice network built from that. And that, even though that's kind of like a more formalized, um, method of like external kind of network, um, I found that really useful um, as well as the Tetley Art Associate Programme that was really great to have that but like before that um, me and my friends um, we, we started a, a crit group in Leeds called Nocturne and we found that was really useful for um, trying to like try to bridge a gap between finishing and graduating university to like not having anything and like not like a system where you know there are regular crit groups happening in Leeds and I think there are now and that's amazing and but I, th I think it, it, at the, that particular time like we only had each other and like our friends were also making work to kind of bounce each other ideas off or to kind of still create a, a like an environment where we could actually have these conversations and support each other so 
yeah, I guess like the, the networks that have been informal have just been kind of grown from friends and like I want to kind of keep making and I want to kind of question what it is that we're doing and how do we get the opportunities and how do we support each other and I think that I'm very grateful and very lucky to have had people in Leeds who who are very open to doing that and I think are still a lot of people are still doing that especially with like artist side spaces and trying to open that up into like broader programs I guess. I think um also the same about critique I think um sort of critical conversation is for me personally I think it's essential for the progression of my own practice and to develop and sometimes when you spend a lot of the time in the studio and you you know you don't have any other sort of uh, opinions or any other eyes on the work I feel like sometimes it's easy to get to go a little bit astray if that's the right word for that um so I do think well I'm doing a a um, studio residency right now funded by my old university Leeds Arts um, and part of it is I've got um, mentoring so I'm using it for sort of like critique and um, while I'm making work and um, so I, that's something that I think is helping sort of with the progression of my practice so but that's only going to last till June so I have been talking to peers about starting a crit group similar to what you said you do let me um, so I think whether I think artists are good to sort of facilitate that whether it could be sort of adopted or helped out on a larger scale, it depends, but. I think it's something that I personally would be definitely interested in being a part of, and I'm sure the people in the region would be as well, you know, and that's why we were talking about ways that institutions and artificial spaces can join up and, you know, kind of contribute to an ecology and help it flourish really. Yeah, because I think there's that, there's obviously um, the kind of peer, kind of critique peer learning that happens between groups of artists, which obviously relies on, I think, friendship, um, giving your time for free. Um, but then in terms of um, institutions, I think there's definitely um, opportunities where we can add a different kind of dimension to that, which is around, you know, us, us mentoring. Um, so it's not always kind of, other artists giving their giving their time for free basically it's also about us being able to learn i want to learn more about who's based in yorkshire and you know i want to do that research and i i need help in connecting you know as well mm -hmm. people recommending oh you should go talk to them or this group of doing this really interesting work so it's kind of a two-way thing as well as yeah roseanne do you want to add anything yeah i mean i think a lot of my education as an artist did come outside of formal ways of learning so like after my um, degree in Manchester I was part of all the DIY cultures so Islington Mill Art Academy who were like an alternative education art education um, so I was part of that for a while and then I was part of um, something called Croc Gallery and a lot of the artists I was working with were making these platforms for themselves and I, I, I ran my own artist led project um, with my partner Debbie called the Penthouse, which I still run now as like a more nomadic platform. And I do think those relationships between those projects and the institutions are really important. And I think neither side can provide everything, but if, if working together, um, I think they can do really interesting things, yeah. Great. Cool. Um, so next question is kind of about how you see your practice shifting within the context of COVID-19. So kind of more specifically how you're going to approach that, especially because you all kind of have quite object orientated um, studio practices and work with kind of sculpture and things like that. So um, yeah, how you feel that that's going to change. I think it was mainly aimed at you, Emmy, this question, but obviously everyone else is free to chip in. If you've got anything to say? Um, I mean, it's something that like I'm still trying to think about in terms of how I'm gonna change the way that I make work because I'm currently up in Scotland and I'm gonna be with my family like for the foreseeable future so I'm not with my studio so I can't make like you know I can't really experiment with various different materials I do have some clay here so I'm gonna try to do some stuff with that but I think mostly at the minute I'm quite interested in just taking the time to do some research into books that I, I've been meaning to, to look at and also to yeah uh, I don't know like maybe do some more writing and also 
do things like drawing which is is something that I really love doing but has kind of fallen out of my practice um, and not really given it time because it's been very focused on like making sculptural work so I'm quite interested in giving myself the time to actually do that and like just yeah doing like paintings or just like sketches for things and um, maybe sharing that on like an online platform at some point I'm not really sure um, but yeah like a, I think like in terms of like the context of the work that I do as well like thinking about how we'll archive this time and like how we will, might change the narrative of this time when it's over I don't know like how 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 will we like look at this in terms of like keeping it like how, how do we record all of this document it for like the future I don't know it'd be quite interesting but yeah I think, think de definitely for me it's going to be a lot of time just doing drawing doing some writing and doing some reading maybe some pots who knows <laughs> Boy, some pots <laughs> anyone else um yeah I don't I don't like the idea of um thinking about my practice being less physical because I feel like I was really at a point where it was becoming more physical and I was really enjoying the relationship with materials and, and thinking with materials um, and I want obviously to be able to continue to do that at the minute I'm still accessing the studio because I can do so without any contact door to door um, and still be in this space like for the next three months um, because basically artists use just this space usually are coming from elsewhere in the UK or Europe and so artists, the next two artists who are booked in to use this studio are not coming so I've actually got this space for another three months but whether I'll be able to use it or not is a different question I've not thought about if I was at home what, what my practice would be like I, don't, I think um, I don't want to think about it yet <laughs> but it, it's, it's made us think of different ways of sharing because I've, I've done a lot of my, well, my work usually involves performance for camera and that was shared through some short videos last year as part of YSI and also like um, photography so I might think of ways of expanding that further um, I don't know how that's going to go yet My practice is uh, predominantly object based so um, I've not been in the studio the past week or so um, I've just been staying away for a little bit just to be safe um, so I'm sort of taking this as, like I said earlier, like my little break, my little bit of time off. Um, but I do a lot of writing sort of behind the scenes, stuff that sort of never reaches the light of day. <laughs> um, so usually when I make a sculpture and sort of the process, I'm always writing and to sort of try and make sense of it in my mind. Um, but recently I've been sort of looking at some of the stuff that I have written because I sort of save a lot of it um, and just seeing if they could be possibly published online as like pieces of work in themselves that sort of like how I view the sculptures in process whether it can actually be I don't know whether it's written quite poetically or whether I just did or something so I'm just sort of um playing around with the text right now and seeing how that could be a piece of work in itself um so yeah that could and that can work sort of when I've got no access to the studio in times like now yeah great thanks um Great. So um, I have a question here, which um, I think is actually more for Helen and Jane. If, if you want to unmute yourself. There we are. <laughs> um, um, which is it's from a, a, a late career artist um, who's beginning to make large scale and interactive sculptures. And they wanted to ask what the best ways of them assessing, um, assessing, accessing opportunities to show work or get advice from organisations and institutions in the region. We we do accept proposals, but we do we receive a lot, um, and that would be at the curators at ysp.org.uk address. That's curators at ysp.org.uk. And we do consider, so we have quarterly curatorial meetings where we do look at all of those proposals. Um, so, and then we do try and feedback wherever possible and be constructive or, you know, if the project isn't taken on, try and be constructive about supporting the artist. And even if we're not able to progress an idea, because most, most of the time our programme and our budget is already overcommitted, but we are always constantly building a research database of artists who we may want to revisit in the future or do studio visits or stuff like that so that would be my suggestion really 
Um, Megan, I think from our point of view as well, we're interested to see how artists are uh, considering working in the public realm as we connect with different local authorities from across Yorkshire, different arts organisations. Obviously, Yorkshire Scotch Park are very well tapped into that too. But if we can offer any supports um, around um, our knowledge about opportunities for people wanting to commission work in the public realm, um, hello at yorkshire-sculpture.org is our email address. Brilliant. Um, so the last audience question that we have um, is, um, again, thinking about how Yorkshire Sculpture International and the partners can be proactive in supporting artists um, right now. But I wanted to use this question really as a way of kind of um, maybe each of the artists and Helen um, focusing in on one kind of takeaway action or something that they think has kind of come from the conversation and is a really important thing to take forward um so yeah if anyone is happy to to kind of let me know i what think, they think. For, for i mean one of the key things i'm taking away from the whole situation is adaptability and how that's going to be vital to everyone individual business institution artist um, but also how important it is to keep talking um, and we don't know what's going to be at the end of it but if we talk it through we'll find solutions together I don't you know we just can't predict what it's going to be like but yeah yeah I think that like I don't know keeping talking maybe like whether institutions can format um I don't know maybe like platforms like this where it can be like a kind of hangout or like a place to kind of talk or share work or, and I don't know how that would go forward I'm not really sure um I don't know it's hard it's really it's, it's a really hard one to kind of pinpoint I mean I, I think that there's definitely ways in which they can support and whether there is ways in which artists can do workshops or can kind of deliver classes or whatever is ways to like support like artist income through like a virtual way could be really interesting and could be really useful for artists who need that at this time um, and also a way to keep like practice going um, or like doing artist talks as well that can be screened and people can kind of tune into them and something like that could be quite interesting. Um, and yeah, kind of providing like that kind of funding source for artists who need it at the time, this time, I think would be really useful. And I think would be really good for other people to also come in and, and like in interact with that kind of content as well um, and reaching a different audience. I think that would be really, really good. Yeah, I think the idea of some online collaborations could be really interesting. I don't know how we do it, but it'd be interesting to think, like you say, um, I haven't thought about, you know, talking to artists in this way online, but it could be really useful. Um, um, whether I'm going to organise something like that myself or like it'd be, it'd be something good for organisations to do, I think, to do more talks like this and to not just put everything on hold and realise, you know, that, that working digitally and doing events in this way um, for artists to get paid to do the sort of workshops and talks and things like that that they would have, that they would have had over the next few months, I think it's really useful. Um, and and it could even address you know the the problem of representation. You could have solo presentations online, maybe you know online exhibitions, um, like say artist talks and stuff like that. Yeah, I think um, t thinking about how we can like support artists going forward in the future, if in situations of like hardship. Um, but I sort of think this is like the start of looking into that and researching those ideas because um, how how things if if things happen like we we can have access to like the Hepworth or wherever it was this was meant to take place um, how it can still go forward and how the artists can be supported and how um, it can happen anywhere so that it's happening from home so um, I think this is a good start to that and it's just continuing to um, look at ways that. It, can still be facilitated even if this goes on for months at a time how how things can still work um with limited resources brilliant thank you so much um so yeah that's the end of the audience questions so i'm just gonna hand over to jane to finish up for today
Thank you so much. I mean, I feel like we should almost revisit in a month's time and see how everybody's getting on. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much to you all for um, to the artists and um, Helen for your contributions for um, responding so positively to this new format, um, which has seems to be working really well. Appreciate uh, you doing that, and uh, for your insightful um, ideas and uh, contributions to helping us think about how we shape the program going forward, as well as how we during our period of research and development, can continue to invest and support artists um, like yourselves and across Yorkshire. Thank you also to the audience who have sent in their questions and uh, contributions in advance. And a special thanks to my colleagues, Megan and Lily, um, for making this happen. We really want to continue this conversation um, with a wider audience um, to hear ideas in the coming days and weeks about how we can think about um, creating time and space for artists, what we can really do um, over, the, over the coming weeks and months to make sure that we're um, adapting and um, enabling things to happen um, through this constantly changing um, landscape, as well as thinking when we go back to some kind of normality about what we can put in place um, for artists. So thank you all. I would um, encourage people to submit questions to um, hello at yorkshire-sculpture.org. We're going to think about how we are um, creating open forums such as this in the future. So we'll be in touch through social media on our website about how we're going to do that. And um, on a positive note, if you're feeling creative, um, our artists are given a lot today, so I'm not asking <laughs> to get involved, but if you would, that'd be great. We have hashtag a sculpture a day. Um, we're encouraging people of um, everybody really to, to get involved and create a sculpture in less than five minutes from what you have in your home and I know we'd love to see as many people get involved with what's been a really enjoyable fun and um, project so thank you all so much um, for today and uh, I look more look forward to more of this thank you thank you thanks, thanks. Bye. see you all soon hopefully yes. see you soon thank you bye, bye. <laughs>